This is a basketball. This is a Spalding basketball. You can buy this at the store for $20. Now, this is used to entertain. This is used as a form of exercise. But one guy used this $20 tool to make $2.1 billion. Let me do the math for you. $20 turned into $2.1 billion. That's 105 million times return on investment, okay? And that man's name is Michael Jordan. The last five weeks, every Sunday, millions of people around the world have tuned into The Last Dance. Today, I'm going to share with you 23 lessons I learned from The Last Dance. Here, catch the ball. By the way, for full disclosure, Spalding had the NBA account for 30 years that they just lost to Wilson. So Spalding, that's a big account to lose because everybody bought this ball. Wilson, congratulations to you. Having said that, let's get right into it. Point number one that I took away. If you're a LeBron James fan, or if the argument of who's the greatest of all time, if there was ever a time that was the worst time for any anti MJ fans, I'm talking LeBron, any other type of player fans. If there was ever a time that you didn't want the last dance to come out, it was this time. Let me explain to you why. It was almost as if it was perfect. You got a pandemic happens. Everybody's forced to stay home. There's no sports, no football, no basketball, no MLB. The only sport conversation is the last dance, and it lasts for five weeks. All the LeBron James fans were sitting there watching. By the way, I'm a LeBron fan now because he's a Laker himself. I'm a Laker fan, right? If you don't think MJ is the GOAT, you're either delusional, you're a troll, you're in your 20s or you're a teenager, or your team lost to him, or number five, you simply didn't watch the last dance. Because lesson number one is Michael is the greatest of all time. No one comes close to him. His DNA, killer instinct, what he did. I was doing a math the other day. If you look at the Pistons games they lost, they should have beaten Pistons in one of the series, which they would have gone to the finals and won. The game number seven that Pippen didn't come well. He was having anxiety attack, panic attacks. If Pippen plays to his best, they win. They go to championships. That's two additional championships. If Mike doesn't retire, those two additional ones, they would have beaten the Rockets. That two, two other right there. And if they would have come back one more season, that would have been 11 championships. He would have probably had 43,000 career points if he wouldn't have had any, any of those things taking place and play a couple more seasons. 43,000 points, 42,000 points, all-time score, all-time everything. That's Michael. So my point number one is the argument for who's the greatest of all time in the history of NBA, the game of NBA, it's over with. At least for 20 more years, the argument's over with. That's my point number one. Point number two, just as much as the argument was made that he's the greatest of all time, Michael Jordan, Here's the challenge why that's not going to last for a long time. Why do you say that, Pat? Here's why. Forget about all the players that watch The Last Dance. Oh, my gosh, all the tweets. <gasps> did you see, Mike, my favorite episodes, number seven? Oh, did you see one? Oh, da, 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 da. Forget about all the players that are playing today. Forget about them because the level of improvement in their game cannot be dramatic. Here's what's scary about it. Millions, millions of young kids, 8-year-old kid, 12-year-old kid, 11-year-old kid watched The Last Dance. These kids got, got a clinic on what it is to have a killer instinct for free. They just watched these episodes on ESPN. There are going to be thousands of kids that are out, outside in the backyard shooting basket with their mom screaming, it's late, it's dark, get inside. No, mom, 20 more shots. Get inside right now. 20 more shots, mom. Get inside. Thousands. Those are the kids I'm excited about. <gasps> the NBA is going to be so exciting 13, 14, 15 years from now. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to see what the NBA is going to look like there. You think Mike, Michael never had a last dance to watch? Let me say this one more time. Michael never had a last dance to watch. Take the last dance, give it to a Michael who was a young kid. Imagine who Michael would have been today. The odds are. The game, the sport of the NBA, the, the brand, the NBA, it just got better. 15 years from now, I just can't wait for 2035 NBA draft pick. I can't wait for that. I can't wait for that day because it's going to be crazy. Number three, my favorite quote of all time is, if a lion could speak, we could not understand them. If there is a quote 
To describe Michael the best, it's this quote. Why? Everybody wants to criticize Michael. Oh, he was a bully. Oh, he was an asshole. Oh, he was a jerk. That's not the way. Did you see the words he used? Did you see what he said to Burrell? Did you see how he punked this guy? Did you see what he did to Kerr? Oh, my gosh. I can't believe what a bully he is. You know, we're talking about here with Mario and Kai about if he was a bully. Mario, Mario said he was a bully. Kai said, I don't think he was a bully. They were both right by the time it was over with. Of course he's a bully. Kai's point was he was not a bully because he didn't bully to belittle you without any outcome. He bullied you to get the best out of you because if you could handle him, you could handle anybody. The part when he fights Steve Kerr and Kerr punches him in the chest after he fouled him hard and then he punches him in the face, in the eye, right there, he told Phil, you keep calling these ticky-tack fouls when I'm fouling him. What are you going to do when this guy faces off the Knicks? How is he going to handle it? That's Michael. Michael is a lion. And if you don't understand him, you are not a lion. Point number four, every great organization has an asshole in it. Now, this asshole here was Jerry Krause. Hate it, you know, just uh, made fun of. Hey, don't smoke cigars because it could stunt your growth. Hey, uh, you know, no matter, no wonder you're so sure. All of these, Scotty, everybody that bullied Jerry, did you see how the end took place when Phil got up and they knew it was the last dance and still, gave respect to the GM, and even Scottie Pippen, who bullied him, said the following. He says, can you imagine what it was like to be part of the greatest organization, Scottie's words, to play with the greatest player of all time, the greatest coach of all time, and you know what else he said? The greatest general manager of all time. The guy he hated the most. He brought Tex, Phil, got rid of Collins, Rodman, Horace, replaced Paxson, brought Kerr. Are you kidding me? Every great organization has an asshole like Jerry Krause, who's a great recruiter. Point number five, MJ had a long FU list. And by the way, he always found ways to add new names to the list. George Carl, you come to the restaurant, I'm eating. You see me, you walk out, you don't say bye to me, no problem. Isaiah Thomas, we play against you. Two years in a row, you punk us in the playoffs. You kick us out. I still come and shake your hand. We beat you the next year. Lambier tells you don't shake hands, and you walk out. No problem when it comes onto the dream team. LeBranford Smith, 37 points. Hey, good game, Mike. Whether he said it or not, no problem. Media, Chicago media, they're going to go to Cleveland. They're not going to win. No problem. Magic, bird, it doesn't matter. This man constantly added names to his list. And it drove him. Sometimes you may want to create your own FU list and help it drive you. Point number six, don't chase money too early. Let me say this one more time. Don't chase money too early. Michael was never the highest paid guy in the NBA until his last year with the Bulls when he got paid $33 million. Never. You know what Michael chased? Michael chased greatness. When he chased greatness, everything came to him. Endorsements, money, opportunity, movies, everything. Because he chased greatness more than he chased money. You chase greatness, guaranteed money is coming early. You over-negotiate your value in the marketplace prior to earning greatness, you're a short-term thinker. Point seven, capitalism works. When MJ first got in the league and he was getting a shoe deal, Converse was number one. They had Magic. They had Bird. When his team went to Converse, they said, we can't make him the face. Why? Because we have Magic and Bird. You haven't earned the right yet. He liked Adidas. Adidas didn't have the money to pay him the quarter million dollar check. Falk goes to uh, Nike. Michael wasn't a Nike fan. Mom and dad call and say, go meet with Nike and just listen to them. He goes, meets with them. The company that wasn't first, wasn't second, it was third on the list, went and competed for Mike as a talent. They got him. What happened to Mike? Greatest of all time. What happened to Nike? The best sporting shoe brand, athletic brand in the world. Capitalism works. Point number eight, leadership matters. And you have to know who's going to get the best out of your people. When Michael was playing for Doug Collins, there was a scene when Michael was playing and Doug, they asked him in the interview, so Doug, what play did you call? 
when you were for Michael in timeout. He said, I just told everybody, get the ball to Michael and get the hell out of his way. Now, obviously, he dropped the F-bomb, but he says, get out of his way. And oh, <laughs> so funny, hilarious. No problem. Jerry Krause realizes you ain't going to win a championship running the ball through one person. He brings a guy named Tex Winner. Tex Winner brings us triangle offense. He brings it to the team. Doug Collins and Tex start having fights together to the point where Doug doesn't even let him sit on the bench. He tells the guy, you don't need to be here. Then Jerry goes, gets Phil, who was a coach in Puerto Rico, who was coaching a whole different league in Albany, New York. Tough guy, former New York player who won a couple championships in 1972, I believe. He brings him on board as the assistant. The assistant starts having more credibility than Doug. They decided to get rid of Doug. Jerry noticed Doug cannot get the best out of the team. They bring Phil in. Phil comes in. Phil says, Mike, the ball's not going through you every single time. Mike says, what are you talking about? Mike loved uh, Doug at that time because the ball always went through him. Phil said, it's not going to go through you. You can be the greatest scorer of all time and never win a championship, or you can be maybe top two, top three scorer and win championships. Which one do you want? Mike bought in to the stronger leader, Phil Jackson. Phil came in. Phil got the best out of Mike. Mike trusted. Game over. Sometimes a better leader is going to get better out of your, is going to get more out of your people. Point number nine, if you decide to be big in your industry, whatever you're doing, I want to be one of the best of all time. I want to be big. I want to be a millionaire. I want to be a billionaire. No problem. In the road of going and becoming a millionaire, being successful, being the best in your industry, you're going to get the attention of the media. Media loves stories like that. You know why? Because media looks at the great American success story and they say, there's got to be something. Maybe this person's an alcoholic. Maybe he's a druggie. Maybe he's a cocaine. Maybe he's a womanizer. Maybe he's a gambler. Maybe he's got some family issues. Maybe he's, maybe he's a narcissistic person. Maybe they're going to come after you. And, and you can either go head on with media or you can build a relationship with them. Mike chose to develop a relationship with the media. And he managed expectation. And it ended up actually being a great relationship where the media loved him and he loved the media. Point number 10, there's a scene in one of the episodes where Reggie Miller from the Pacers is talking about what it was like to shoot Space Jam and they build a basketball court for him and Michael brought all the players and summertime everybody was playing against each other. And he said he would come, he would play with us for three hours. After three hours he would go work out, after work out he had, uh, then he would do this. Then he had a six o'clock, then he said like, this guy was a vampire. When did he ever sleep? By the way, so many stories. Michael played poker all night, Michael did this all night. Michael, for a person like Michael to do what they do, they have a certain level of energy that's indescribable. They, they don't need coffee. They don't need all the other stuff. Their determination is so flipping big and laser beam focused to make their vision a reality where they typically can go with less sleep than others do. And some may call them vampire. Point number 11, you're one new teammate, one new employee, one new player, one new client, one new salesperson, one new person away from taking your company to a whole different level, from taking your team to a whole different level. One player changed a franchise from 4,000 people coming to the game to sell out since the day Michael got drafted. The Bulls have been a sellout. One guy comes to the city of Chicago, changes the game economically, fame, party and nightlife, restaurants, in every possible way. Find that one person, change the life of your business forever to come. Point number 12, there's a scene where he is doing the commercial with Spike Lee and Spike Lee says, it's gotta be the shoes. No, it's not the shoes. It's gotta be this, no, it's not, it's got. And finally Mike's like, look, here's what I was trying to say. It's not the shoes, it's not. It's my work ethic. He says, I guarantee you if I average two points a game, nobody would have paid me the kind of money they paid me. Nobody would have come to watch me. Mike said this. Mike said this. By the way, you know the uh, big baller brand? Great idea. But Zoe didn't show up. If Zoe was Mike, let's take that same idea, big baller brand, and let's make Zoe MJ. Big baller brand, but it's MJ who is big baller brand. You know what would have happened to big baller brand? it probably would have been a multi-billion dollar empire because it's the player you bank on. You might have a great idea. It's the player you bank on. Mike said, I work so hard to get good at my craft. It ain't the shoes. It's my work ethic and my game that got me to where I'm at today. Point number 13, 
eventually for an empire, for a company, for an organization to flourish, there's got to be trust. You have to trust the coach. Mike finally trusted Phil. And Mike learned the hard way. He didn't trust any of his teammates. He learned to trust Pippen. He learned to trust B.J. Armstrong. He learned to trust Paxson. He learned to trust Ku Coach. He learned to trust Steve Kerr. And eventually he won six championships. But winning at the highest level, trust is very critical. Point number 14, sometimes to bring back a client, to bring back a, uh, a, a recruit, to bring back a talent, to bring back somebody that maybe stepped away or stepped away for a couple of years or is retired or there was a fallen out, sometimes a person to do that isn't the number one person in the company or number two or number three or number four or anything. It's just somebody that the other guy had a relationship with. And in this case, B.J. Armstrong had a relationship with Michael. And so when Michael was in Chicago and B.J. said, hey, man, Let's play. I don't think you can beat me one-on-one. -on -one. They play. Michael trusted BJ. BJ encouraged him to come back. BJ indirectly recruited Michael back just because Michael trusted BJ because BJ was harmless and the rest is history. Point number 15, sometimes when you win at something, and I mean at the highest, highest level, everybody tells you how amazing you are. You start believing you can be amazing at everything you do, and it's just not true. And it's very, very hard for hyper-competitive people. Very. Michael goes, does the basketball thing, becomes the greatest, goes, plays baseball, then leaves. And I know some people said if he had 1,500 more at-bats, he would have ended up being a baseball player, professional, all this. But he would have never been the greatest baseball player of all time, although he became the greatest basketball player of all time. Know your limits and be comfortable with what you can and cannot do. I understand if he did the baseball thing to get it out of his system. Fully get it. Fully understand why that decision was made. Father, all that stuff. Fully get that part. But uh, you won't be great at everything. Just because, you, it's just because you were great at one thing. Point number 16. There's a scene where they're sitting there and says, well, that's what they did to Shaq. And, you know, that's what's going on with Shaq. And, you know, here's what he says, I'm not Shaq. And they say it again. says, I'm not Shaq. They say it again. says, I'm not Shaq. Now, what was he saying? There's a lot of different ways you can interpret that. Guys at that level hate to be compared. I mean, hate to be compared to anybody. Don't compare me to anybody. I'm one of a kind. Do not compare me to anybody. Michael wanted to prove a point that don't ever compare anyone else to me. I'm one of a kind. If you think you're one of a kind, you can say don't compare me to anybody. But every time he was called and compared to somebody else, he went and proved everybody wrong that he's one of a kind. If you don't want to be compared to anybody, go make the argument. That part's on you. Point number 17, look, just because you hate an opponent doesn't mean you can't respect them. You know, when they asked him about Isaiah, you could tell he cannot stand Isaiah as a person. You could tell. I mean, it was oozing out of him how he can't stand Isaiah as a person. But he said, to me, he is the second greatest point guard of all time behind Magic Johnson. And that's a lot of respect because you're talking about Stockton. You're talking about all these modern-day point guards. He put him second greatest of all time, Isaiah Thomas. So just because you don't like an opponent doesn't mean you can't respect their game. Point number 18. You see, the more you compete in your field and you beat people, right? Oh, you know, I'm beating people at YMCA. I'm beating people at Venice Beach. Oh, I'm, so real estate. Oh, I'm beating people in my own office. Oh, it's great. Oh, I'm beating people in my region. Oh, that's great. And then when it gets to nationally, then you face real competitors, okay? So you may be the alpha of your small little office. You may be the alpha of your region, but as it gets bigger, you realize who the real alpha is. They're playing in the dream team. They're playing that pickup game where Magic's talking trash, birds on the sidelines, they're going back and forth. And Magic may have been a better trash talker. Even Gary Payton may have been a better trash talker. A lot of players may have been better trash talkers, but eventually nobody was a bigger alpha than Michael Jordan. Not because he was a bigger alpha, because there's this misconception that alpha is about personality. Alpha is not personality. Alpha is results in the field you've chosen to compete in. If you're an alpha, that means you beat all the other alphas. And that's exactly what Michael did. Once Michael beat all the other alphas, he didn't have to say nothing. Magic came out and says, we just realized 
when Bird came up to him and says, listen, there's a new sheriff in town, Magic. We just have to accept it. This guy's just better than us. And it was game over. So don't bank your alpha thing on personality. Bank it on your game. Point number 19, don't be afraid of challenging your people and don't apologize for it. You know, one of my favorite personalities in the history of football was Mike Ditka. I love Ditka. Here's a guy that ended up becoming, creating a new position tight end. Then he goes and becomes a player, uh, uh, you know, wins a championship, eh, coaching, wins a championship. And then later on in life, when I interviewed him, he was apologetic about how hard he was with people, how much he pushed him. It was almost like, well, maybe I shouldn't have done this. I'm like, I didn't want to see that. It was almost like, I wish I would have never done the interview because I want to take that out of my mind. What I liked about Mike Ditka in the interview saying, here's a quarter, go call someone who cares. And it's like, you know what? The way the guy was, it's just, if you ever want to watch highlights of Mike Ditka as a coach, go watch him. The 84 Bears documentary, Mario, we watched that where? We took like 50 people and we watched it at the Ohika Castle in New York. We rented out the entire property, 32 rooms, and I had everybody watch that documentary. Why? Don't apologize for driving the hell out of your people, but be aware to have a cushion above you. What do I mean by this? If you are the highest level of cushion and you drive the hell out of everybody, and they can't go somewhere else, you're in trouble. Meaning, let me explain. Michael is driving everybody. Burrell, Kerr, Pippen, Horace, he's driving everybody. That if he crosses the line, Phil will say, get out of the game, go home. Which he told him, Phil told him. And then Phil calls Jordan saying, call to Kerr and apologize. Then Jordan called Kerr and apologized because Kerr spoke to Phil and he was furious. There's a cushion. Drive but make sure you're good with the person above you because that cushion is needed for you to be able to drive harder. I don't know if this part makes sense or not. In some uh, environments, it may not be possible, but you got to make sure you drive people to a level with having a cushion that people say things like, uh, like for instance, I drive my sons. They go to the you know, mom. Yeah, I can't believe how that, da, 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 that is so, da. but he loves you. No, he doesn't. You know he loves you. Yeah, he does. So go back. He wants the best. You need that. Don't apologize, but find a cushion. With the cushion, you can drive even harder. Without it, you can't. Point number 20 is sometimes you are not going to want to show up. You're just not going to want to show up for valid reasons. He's in Utah, Salt Lake City. Tim Grover orders a pizza. Michael eats it by himself. Five people show up, and they kind of worry, hey, Mike, I don't have a good feeling about this. Tim is telling this to Mike, and Mike eats the pizza by himself. 2.30 in the morning, he calls Tim. Tim comes up, throwing up all over the place. Doctors, all this stuff, goes to the game. Tim gave him great advice saying, one of the things I'm telling you right now is when you're this sick, you got to play the entire game. You can't take a break because your body, you got to play the whole game. Tim just posted something, I think yesterday, he said 44 minutes, 38 points is what he posted about that game. And Mike comes, scored 38 points, 44 minutes, they win that game. He fully didn't feel like playing. And he had all the right reasons to not play. Sometimes you got to play and show up even though you have valid reasons, valid reasons to not show up, you still got to show up. 21's a little painful because I'm a big Scottie Pippen fan, but 21 to me is sometimes when you quit, some things will never leave you. You can lose, it's fine. You'll be forgiven. You can get knocked out, no problem. You'll be forgiven. You can't quit. You, You can't quit and show an example of uncoachability in a public scene, that's going to stay with you for a long time. When I saw that myself, I said, I hope they weren't going to go there, but they did. And I know Scotty said, if I had to do it all over again, I would have done the same thing again. Of course you wouldn't have, because there are millions of decisions that people go through that they would have done differently. It just means you don't have wisdom to make the better decision. And I'm a diehard Scotty fan. I'm I'm a Scotty fan myself. I just think sometimes um, when everything makes sense for you to quit and certain decisions are being made that's unfair, coach says, cool coach is going to take the last shot instead of you and Michael's not playing and you're the number one player, your name is Pippen, and you're offended by that, you can still be coachable after the game, privately bring it up to your coach, not publicly. It'll leave a mark on your reputation for a long time. Point number 22 is what I call the flag carrier mentality, is uh, Michael fought for Phil. If, if, if Jerry brings Phil back, Michael comes back, right? And he said that many times. Michael defended Phil till the very end, very, very end. 
says a lot about his character. You know, it's crazy. Even when I talked to uh, Kobe, when I interviewed Kobe, and I said, Kobe, what do you see about all this stuff people are saying about the Knicks and what Phil did as a general manager? You know, he's being trashed right now the last two or three years. He says, listen, to me, Phil is like a father figure. He's one of the greatest mentors I ever had in my life. And you see how Mike talks about Phil. When you find the Phil in your life, man, it's not easy to find a person like that. Protect them, keep them, maintain the relationship. Don't let anybody ever say anything to the fill of your life. Point number 23, this is the last one. And partly, I love this, but also don't. And let me explain to you why. Uh, when it ended, uh, par, uh, the last dance, uh, episode number 10, where they say, Jerry comes out, the owner. He says, well, yeah, you know, we would have uh, offered Phil to come back, but Phil said he thinks it's best to step away. And because Phil didn't want to step on the toes of Jerry Krause, the owner said, no, Phil, you ought to come back. He said, but Jerry wants to go a different direction. And he's asking a question about Michael. And so, Mike, what do you think about what Jerry said? For? He says, since that day, 1990, we've never had a conversation about it. Why didn't we come back? Why didn't we come back? Why didn't we do this? Why don't we go one more? Why doesn't everybody take a one-year contract? And he watches it and sees what is being said, by the way, just so you know. He watches it and sees what's being said. And they had to cut it. I don't know if you caught that. He was speechless. And I bet he said something. And then he told the camera guy, let me say a different thing here to finish up my thoughts. Because he was speechless. 22 years that's been on his mind, never been brought up and talked about. Why don't we come back one more season? Let's defend what's ours. Somebody's got to dethrone us. You can't go like this. So the guy says, are you happy with the way your career ended being at the top? Everyone's expecting for him to say what? The typical answer, which is yes, very happy. To him. He says, no, not at all. He says, what if we go one more time? What if we win seven? What if we win seven? Can you imagine? This guy's in his mid-50s. He has three kids that are older, two sons and a daughter. And he's got twins with his new marriage. I believe he's got twins with his new marriage. He's worth a couple billion dollars. He's at dinner and partied with any name in the world, any name in the world, presidents, billionaires, models, celebrities, ace, it doesn't matter, any, he's experienced royalty at the highest, stayed at the best hotel rooms in the world, 50 some years old, and his stomach is still not full. Man, that says a lot about this guy. His stomach is still not full. The average guy will be like, no, you know, sometimes you just have to kind of go and da, 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 da. No, no, no. He says, no. The guy still wants to know that I could add my seven. I mean, if a lion could speak, you could not understand him. One of a kind. One of a kind type of a player. One of a kind. Listen, two times I cried as a kid, growing up, when we came to the States. One, and I told this to Magic, one was when Magic uh, came out and announced HIV positive. Cry like a little baby. Oh my gosh, I was 12, 13 years old. I, mean, I was devastated when he came out and said that. You know what the second time was? When Michael retired the first time. I was, I was not cool with that. Why? Because, you know, when you love a game and you love to compete and you have a guy like him that's a once in a, gener once in a lifetime, we may not see another Michael. May, we may not see during my lifetime. Michael's one of a kind. When you get a person like that that changes the game, you have to respect the game. And when this man, after all these years, after all these accolades, after all the money, after everything he's experienced, he still says, no, I'm not satisfied, that tells you this is a dude that even if he would have won his seventh, I guarantee you, if you reshoot and let's just say they would have come back and won seven, and they would have gone for eight, he would have still said, I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied. Because it's not enough for a strange, weird, wired looking guy like this. This guy, that's what you call a lion. So my final thoughts on him for point number 23 is, no matter how much he won, he wanted more. So those are my 23 lessons from the last sense. And by the way, if you want today's message in PDF format, text Jordan to 310-340-1132. Once again, Jordan to 310-340-1132. Or click on a link below to go subscribe to my newsletter, and we'll send a PDF to you as well. And by the way, if you haven't seen my interview 
with Kobe Bryant. Click over here. We covered a lot of these topics together. And if you've not seen my sit down with Magic on how he talks about Michael, click on this interview here. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.